what an introduction. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, in that video, uh, you know, better aircraft make a better world. And, and that's what I was uh, rambling on about last night at the dinner. It really is impressive when we talk about the fact A320s burn half the fuel of 150 seaters that were flying 30 years ago. Half the carbon footprint. Bigger, more comfortable seats. And in terms of noise, it's unbelievable. Remember on the A320 Neo, we said we'd be 10 dB below stage four. Now stage four isn't even official yet, but 10 dB below where it's going to be, and we're one or two dB better than that. It really is an amazing airplane. And I believe that the Max will be uh, doing well uh, also in terms of those categories. So uh, this whole industry is, uh, is moving forward. In terms of uh, world GDP, it is driven by world GDP. We all know that. It tends to track world GDP uh, very well because it is such an integral part of the world GDP. That's where we're going, uh, most of us, going to IATA this afternoon or tomorrow morning, where the world's airlines are getting together because they are the infrastructure of air travel and you know critical freight movement around the world. Well, there's GDP. Whoops, we want to get that little uh, arrow out of the way. If somebody would be kind enough to do that, thank you. We look now at uh, passenger growth. And you can see that uh, despite some comments, uh, Peggy, that uh, from IATA, that, well, last month it was only up by 4%. Well, that's still pretty impressive. In February, it was up by 8%. So uh, the fact is, it looks like it's been pretty solid there for we're going back to about 2003. And those are rates of growth. This isn't, you know, we're flat. Those are rates of growth year on year. So we are expanding as the economy expands. And you can use a rule of thumb that on average, it's about twice the rate of growth of GDP around the world. Now, let's divide it up into individual markets. And you can see something quite different. You have the mature market of the United States. Very mature, you know, big queues of airplanes and key airports trying to take off. 95% load factors are higher in some of these airplanes. Growth rate, 3.3%, and that rate seems pretty flat for at least the, the last couple of years. It was actually even lower a few years before that. You do Western Europe, and it is higher, close to 5%. It's been increasing lately. It's driven in large part by the low-cost carriers, the easy jets, the uh, uh, that other guy in, in Ireland that uses some airplane, I forget, and uh, you know, Wiz and, and, and others. But uh, it is allowing people to fly. It's allowing people to fly that 10 years ago were not flying. And here's where you really see the difference. Although it seems to be going down as a rate of growth in the last few years, it's still enormous. Think about 8%, 8.2% year over year rate of growth. That's what's driving this industry. Market uh, demand, we've got uh, 6,400 new orders in the last five years. And that's why we're ramping up production. And people say, well, gee, you know, are you sure you need to have this ramp up of production? Well, what are we supposed to do? We've got legally binding contracts with deposits paid for these orders. Of course we have to ramp up production. This isn't like the automobile industry. You know, Tom Williams, Fabrice, and I don't sit around, Didier Everard, and try to figure out how many airplanes we should produce next year, and then run around and see if we can sell them, which is what the car manufacturers do. And if they can't sell them, they have rebates and sales, etc. We will not put an aircraft in production unless we have legally binding contracts for that airplane. So when people start saying, should they ramp up production, should they not, I don't know why there's a debate about that. If you've got the contract for the airplane, someone wants to buy it, you should ramp up production. If you go back over the last five years, you can see that orders were pretty strong. Uh, I couldn't help but point out that we were beating the other guy for quite a few of the last five years there. But it is lower right now. You can see in 2015 it was slowing down a bit in terms of orders. That's normal and natural. If it didn't start slowing down, I'd start wondering about the real value of some of those orders. You know, how can you have orders of 1,000 airplanes a year and be producing 650 or so? So the, we have to get back into balance with a book to bill of around one. We think we're going to be there this year. Uh, I think Boeing will be as well. 
it is uh, slowing down. Imagine that as being, well, you're about a third of the way through the year, so multiply that by three, and it'll still be a, a step down from 15. But as long as it's a book to bill of one or better, we're quite content going forward because of this chart. This chart assumes that from today on to uh, 2020, we only book orders equal to what we're delivering, book to bill of one. And in the past, as you saw, we've been going on double that. So just assuming that conservative book to bill of one, you can see that the, the backlog the, is still very strong. So if you say, well, are you sure some of those low-cost carriers might not want to you know, delay some orders? I certainly hope so. Uh, isn't somebody going to go bankrupt? Probably. And that's why, at least in the single aisle, we've got that big head going forward. And that is another reason why we're quite comfortable with the ramp up to 60 airplanes, or for those sitting at my table last night, uh, you know I'm lobbying for even more than 60 going forward, because I'm looking at those real orders sitting on top of the ramp up. So it's a good position to be in going forward, and it's being driven by the growth in air travel. Now this goes all the way back to the dawn of the jet age, basically when the 747 was introduced, uh, in 1970, and I was driving a yellow cab in New York City. It was a, a fun time. But the industry, look at the size. These are RPKs. The industry was about half a trillion RPKs a year. Look where it is right now. It's up there at about six and a half trillion. That's about 12 times. That's impressive when you think about it. It's 12 times bigger than it was when the 747 was introduced. All those people who never even dreamt of flying are now flying, and they need airplanes to fly in. And that air traffic growth, you can see recessions, I've put them in there, the oil crisis, Gulf crisis, Asian crisis, 9-11. And let's go back to 9-11. People thought the industry would never be the same. And remember all the pundits and some of you are writing articles about this industry has changed forever. A few of us, wild optimists, were saying, no, it hasn't. It'll come back. And I dare say we were right. Because look what happened. It did flatten out in one of the biggest blows any industry could have. 9-11 in the United States, all airplanes stopped. Airplanes not getting into the United States. People terrified about getting into airplanes. And look what happened. A, a pause for a couple of years, and then growth continues so that now we are double the size of the industry on 9-11, double the size in terms of people flying around the world. Every 15 years, the industry doubles in size. Out in Asia, it's about every 10 years the industry has been doubling in size. Not our industry per se, it's the air traffic industry, the airline industry, the number of people flying the revenue passenger kilometers. And one of the reasons for that is people have money. The rise of the middle class which was a phenomenon that you really only had in Western Europe, the United States, and say Japan and Australia. All the rest of the countries around the world 30 years ago were either, if you were in the country, you were either very rich or you were very poor. There wasn't a big middle class. Well, if you go back just about 10 years and look at Europe, you can see a very interesting phenomenon. The middle class stays about the same. It doesn't increase, it doesn't decrease populations uh, are basically the same in Western Europe. Put North America in there, and you see a very similar story. Stays pretty flat, doesn't really increase, doesn't decrease. Uh, Donald Trump, by the way, is going to fix that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into that. <laughs> I'm sort of the token American ever says, you know, how could you be electing Donald Trump? I didn't vote for him. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I've got to be careful when it comes to president. I won't be allowed back in. Other emerging markets, look at that. Other emerging markets around the world are doubling, and then you get Asia Pacific. Go back 10 years, 600 going to about 2,600. Look at the growth rate of the middle class. And what does it mean if you're middle class? Well, it means you've got disposable income. You can meet all of your needs with housing and the rest, and you have money left over to spend. So it's not just disposable income that you're using to fly. In places like India, people who got off the train, so they're getting on airplanes for visiting friends and family, VFR, etc. But it also means as the economy picks up, 
you're traveling for business. Small businesses are discovering that it's economical to move people around on some of these low-cost carriers. And that's driving tremendous growth around the world. So much so that you get real changes from what people would believe. Now, this is today, and by the way, we'll have our new global market forecast out uh, at the uh, Farm Bureau Air Show this year, because Kira and I were just talking about the fact that our database always oh, seems to be about two years out of phase here, but it hasn't changed very much. You look at Asia Pacific, about 29%, uh, Europe, about 25% of all the, the traffic, and 25% uh, uh, over there. These are, uh, you know, RPKs by the airlines based in those countries. And then it goes down to Africa being the lowest. Well, that's pretty much what you would expect. 20 years ago, when I started doing these presentations around the world, it was basically the United States, North America is the biggest one. The second one was Europe, and then the small one was Asia Pacific. We were predicting Asia Pacific would grow such that they would end up being the biggest one. And sure enough, they're slightly bigger. But what happens in the next 20 years? The growth of that middle class, the growth of that for visiting friends and relatives, leisure, plus business travel, will make Asia Pacific the real center of aviation travel around the world. And then Europe uh, will get bigger, and everybody gets bigger, North America gets bigger, but they become a much smaller percentage of all the aviation travel around the world. So if you want to see what this industry is going to look like, in 20 years, you need to see what Asia will look like in 20 years, because we're tracking that very carefully. Asia Pacific right now, we threw a, a few things, uh, quotes in there, or sound bites, or whatever you might use in, in some of your articles that we're proud of anyway. The first A320 NEO was delivered to India. Some people don't know that. Uh, Indigo is flying several aircraft right now, taking more, and these are with the old engines, Pratt engines. Uh, they're running over 99% dispatch reliability. ANA uh, uh, said they're going to start flying A380s. Uh, the uh, A350 XWB, about a third of the total order book for that airplane, is out in Asia Pacific. And then on the NEO, Garuda is the third Asian airline to order the aircraft. A third of the Airbus in-service fleet today is in Asia Pacific, and it'll be substantially higher in 20 years, with 2,000 aircraft in our backlog belonging to Asia Pacific. Then Europe, about 31%. You'd expect that uh, we're a European uh, manufacturer. Uh, 50 daily A380 flights at Heathrow. Think about that. 50 daily A380 flights at Heathrow. It's a congested airport. The only way we're going to double traffic every 15 years at Heathrow is to use bigger aircraft. Our A320neo is moving into the market. Uh, airlines are very happy with that. And then you have the Americas, a smaller percentage for us. Uh, it would be uh, slightly bigger for Boeing, but uh, I think Boeing is heavier and stronger in that mature market than we are. We're catching up. But if I had a choice of being the dominant player in the fast-growing Asian Pacific market or the slower-growing domestic markets of uh, the U.S. and Western Europe, I'd take Asia Pacific, which is exactly where we are going forward. And then some of you say, or some of the wags of the industry, ah, oh, you know, I wonder, you know, Airbus is really getting dependent upon some of these big Middle East carriers. Not in the overall picture of things, we're not. 10% of our in-service fleet there, 450 aircraft, a lot of them are white bodies in our backlog, are from the Middle East, but that isn't a, a very big percentage at all. So we're quite comfortable with that. Then we have the family, the A320 family. We'll get into some of this in more detail in Kieran's presentation, but I draw your attention to that number. Every two seconds, an A320 is taking off or landing somewhere in the world. Every two seconds, one, two, one, two. An A320 took off or landed somewhere in the world. And as we go into the future, it'll get down to every one second. This is the workhorse of the industry. We delivered our 7,000th aircraft, MSN number 7,000, to our friends at Volaris uh, just a little while ago, at the beginning of May. And of course, the A321 is taking the world by storm. 2,800 sales to over 100 customers. 
Last year, uh, this year, it'll be 40% of our single aisle deliveries. Next year, it'll be the year after, it should be moving up to about 50% of our single aisle deliveries. That is absolutely amazing going forward. And the A320neo is also taking the world by storm. We said 15% better fuel consumption. And we're getting somewhere between 16 and 17%. We said 10, de uh, 10 dB below stage four. We're getting 11, 12 dB below stage four. And of course, when you burn less fuel, it's less NOx, it's uh, less pollution, it's less uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Uh, it's much better for the environment. So we're pleased. We think this is probably one of the better things we ever came up with in December of 2010. But if you remember December of 2010, when we launched this program, a lot of you were saying the jury is still out. Will it work or will it not work? Our competitor was saying, let's do an all-new clean sheet of paper airplane for $15 billion. We said the technology was not there, and most of the technology would come from the engine, so let's just put a new generation of engines on our existing airplanes, clean up the aerodynamics of our existing airplanes, and we have a win-win for everybody, because we don't spend $15 billion, so we don't have to charge the airlines amortization of that $15 billion in the price of the airplane. It worked beautifully going forward, and Boeing followed us with the max. And uh, dare I say uh, that uh, we've got about 60% of that market. And the reason for that, uh, uh, I don't like to take credit for my fantastic sales team. I, I think they're about as good as uh, the Boeing sales team. But, uh, okay. okay, better than the Boeing sales team. <laughs> I got an insurrection starting down here. No, they're better than the Boeing sales team. Uh, but, in December of 2010, I would have told you an A320CO was better than a 737NG by a little bit. And then Boeing would have come in and given you a presentation that they're better. Well, they say by a lot, but they just lie. The fact is, it's a little bit that's why I did my Pinocchio ears. Anyway, most airlines would say they were so close together, except for Airbus's <laughs> bigger seat and the containerized cargo, they were virtually identical in the market. So we had about a 50-50 split. But we were able to do more with our NEO than they could do with their MAX. They're sitting low to the ground. They can't really get a bigger fan size in like we could. Uh, we were able to get the geared turbo fan on our airplane. They stayed with CFM. We offered two. And then we were able to do a little bit more aerodynamic cleanup. They did some aerodynamic cleanup too. But again, it drives down a lot to the engine. So we ended up with from being just about equal to being better in the marketplace. The airlines are voting with their order books. They're seeing about a 60-40 split in terms of what they want to order for that single aisle market. And, and we're comfortable with that. And after a lot of yelling and screaming, I think my friends in Seattle will probably get comfortable with that as well. Anyway, the A320neo, as we said before, is the undisputed market leader. It has 79%, say 80%, market share since we launched the program, and they launched their program about six, seven months after we launched ours. That really is amazing when you think about it. This is probably the most efficient airplane in the world because big singles are always going to be more efficient than light twins. By definition, there's less uh, frontal area moving through the air, less drag, etc. So if you get the same number of people in a long, thin airplane, it's going to be more efficient than in a wider airplane. By you know, the, the laws of uh, aerodynamics and, and physics, we have the better long, thin airplane, and uh, that's got about 80% of the market going forward. And it opens up new routes, like crossing oceans, that the 757 does today. But I was talking to an airline CEO, European airline CEO, last week, who was talking about how he wants to replace his 757s with A321neos and open up even more routes across the Atlantic. It makes sense. You can do secondary city to secondary city. There's a market potential, we think, of about a thousand aircraft just in that long range sector. Now, some of you have been talking about the middle of the market. And you've been talking about the middle of the market because they've been talking about the middle market out in Seattle. I guess they, they like to talk a bit. But as we look at the lineup here, you see orders in the last five years. 
the light twin, or the smallest twin you can have up there, is a 330 <coughs> up against their 787-8. We've got, in terms of orders, two-thirds of all the orders in the light twin category. And if you take our 321 in the last five years up against their 737 max, uh, we've got 75% of the order book. 79 was going all the way back to the beginning of the program, 75 in the last five years. So at least from our point of view, we don't see this middle of the market product gap. But if you were looking at that from Seattle, you would see a middle of the market product gap. And you'd be saying, what are we going to do about it? It's not easy what you do to fill that. Because if you do a clean sheet of paper airplanes, $15 billion. Well, you know, you'd like to fix the 737-9 and maybe do a light twin, 15 billion is an awful lot of money to pay to put two airplanes in there. So I think what they'll probably do is come out with uh, an updated engine on the 737-9, trying to make it more competitive uh, with the A321. Perhaps Kieran can talk a little bit more about what we see in that marketplace. We're not worried because they still have the short landing gear. They still will be trying to get close to a Me2 airplane and not quite reaching the performance of the 321. They haven't named it yet, but uh, we have, uh, we believe it will be called the Mad Max. <laughs> anyway, then looking at the, the A330, uh, we're very pleased with that. An A330 takes off her lands in that light twin category every 20 seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week around the world. It is the workhorse of the twin engine market. 350 aircraft in backlog right now. A very impressive airplane. We sold quite a few, but then we said, well, Neo worked extremely well for single lot. Let's do a Neo version of our best-selling wide-body twin, the world's best-selling wide-body twin, and look what we come up with. We get from the engine about 11% improvement, but we get an aerodynamic improvement of 4%, so we have about 10% uh, about a 15% improvement going forward. So uh, that is an impressive number on a wide body twin. A lot of people don't believe that, uh, that this airplane has been changed a lot, but it really has. The inside looks like a, a, a 350, we'll get to that in a minute, but the outside has 3.7, basically four meters more wingspan than today's 330 CO. It has belly fairing cleanup. It has a lot of aerodynamic cleanup. We're at 242 ton takeoff weight. We're looking at bringing that up to 245 ton takeoff weight, or perhaps even beyond, which means more range and payload on the airplane. It will be a very impressive airplane, and it stays within category E. Now, category E means you don't need to put folding wings and all sorts of other stuff on that. Uh, to stay out of Category F gates. That's why the 777, by the way, uh, would be a Category F airplane that folds its wings up so it stays in Category E. We found a pretty efficient way to stay in Category E ourselves with this airplane going forward. 14 to 15 percent fuel efficiency improvement. Uh, for those of you who did the previous slide, 11 and 4 is 15 percent improvement. <laughs> okay. Uh, full commonality with the A330, common type rating, same type rating as the 350 XWB, 186 orders from 10 customers around the world, and we have the new airspace interior in that airplane. Look at that interior. That is a beautiful interior going forward. And here we have an A330neo and an A330, uh, A350 XWB to a passenger they're going to be very similar airplanes. And what we were really looking for is the two interior pictures side by side. But maybe Kieran can have that in his presentation. If you look at the two interior presentations, slides, side by side of a 330neo and an A350XWB, I'll bet you can't tell which one is which. I guarantee a passenger won't either. That's impressive. You now have the same experience as a 350, and a much better experience in our home than a 787 in a 330neo going forward. But what about the economics? Well, we're going to have a few more seats, and they're going to be 18-inch seats. Uh, we have the same range as a 787-8, and we have 
about two and a half percent or so better fuel burn. Now Boeing would say they've got two and a half percent better fuel burn. Even if the airlines say they're equal, all right, I'll take equal. So here we have equal range, equal cash operating cost, equal fuel burn, a brand new modern airplane that's about 25% lower in capital cost than the 787 going forward. That is a very attractive uh, economic model. If you look at it with the A330-900, the 787-9, you see something very similar, about the same in fuel per seat, cash operating cost per seat. The one thing you do see in their advantage is uh, about another thousand or so, 1,500 nautical miles more in range. Not every airline needs to fly for 15 hours in these airplanes. If you don't, you're much better off in a 330neo. But that's one of the reasons why we're looking at more takeoff weight on the airplane, which means more uh, fuel you can load on board, and you can actually fly it further to try to narrow that gap on an airplane that's still about 25% lower capital cost than the 787 going forward. Then we have the 350 XWB, 800 orders, 24 deliveries, uh, uh, 780 aircraft in the backlog, beautiful interior, again, airspace interior, looks like the other airspace interior, comfort, ambiance, we've really got it, we'll be talking more about that uh, going forward. And uh, these are 24 aircraft delivered, our friend uh, Pekka from uh, Finnair is very, very happy with his airplane, our overall experience. The new aircraft types are unreservedly positive. Well, thank you very much. That's an airline CEO. As you know, airline CEOs can be uh, quite critical of the operation uh, of the airplane, quite critical of manufacturers. It's nice to know that someone is very happy with the products going forward. Uh, A350-1000, entry into service, December of 2017. Developments on track, 181 orders for that airplane going forward. And uh, we see that as a 1,000 aircraft replacement market. Compared to the 777-300ER, if we want to do a mission, let's say we leave London and fly to Singapore, we would have the same number of passengers as Boeing would, although we'd have the 18-inch seats, and with their ten abreast, they'd have 17-inch seats. But we'd have about the same number of passengers. We'd have the same range, actually, we would be about 400 miles greater, but let's say the same range, same cargo capacity, but their airplane would take off 40 tons heavier. 20 tons of structure, because it's an old airplane and it's heavier than our clean sheet of paper airplane, and 20 tons more fuel that they would have to burn flying from London to Singapore to do the exact same mission. And we would fly there, flying at Mach 85, and they'd be flying around 83 or so. Uh, we'd have that 6,000 foot cabin They'd have 7,800 to 7,900 foot cabin. So all in all, Boeing said, you know, we've got a problem. We have a real competitive shortfall with the 777-300ER. And two years ago, at the Dubai Air Show, they claimed the entire market moved to 40 to 50 seats bigger with the 777X, which was a Category F airplane to fold the wings to make it a Category E airplane. Now, the 777-300ER was a very good selling airplane. And dare I say, it pushed the 340 out of the marketplace. It, it, was, it was a pretty good airplane. And overnight, we were stunned, overnight, they said it's obsolete. The new future is 40 to 50 seats bigger and folding wings going forward. Well, look at how many airplanes they sold in the last two years. It's not many, because after that splash with uh, you know, Tim Clark, and then Akbar got involved with buying some airplanes, FDI bought some airplanes, and, you know, things slowed down dramatically. We don't believe that two years ago, in November, the market just dramatically changed away from that size category. We believe that size category is still there. Airlines like it. It's a very good size category. It's a good range setting. They just like a better, more efficient airplane and that's going to be called a 350-1000 in December of next year when it enters service. 23% lower cost per seat. That's a lot. Cash operating cost per seat, it's even lower, uh, about 25-26% lower fuel consumption. That's an impressive dynamic going forward. But let's say, okay, uh, 
you know, Airbus can look at that market going forward, and we talked about that last night on a few of the tables. Should we stretch the 351,000? Should we not? And we're debating that internally, talking to some of the, uh, the industry, but I'm not convinced that the entire market just moved over there. So let's say the market for the 777-300ER stays where it is, a thousand airplanes at least. We've got a 351,000 sitting there, replacing all those 777-300ERs, but we don't do a stretch, so it has to compete with the stretch. How is it going to compete with the 777X? We think pretty well. It's 35 tons lower empty weight. 35 tons lower empty weight. Now, they've got about, in this configuration, 32 more seats. Oh, it was in Ottawa. 40 more seats as well. Okay, we can argue back and forth. Depends on the airline layout. Let's say 32 to, to 40 more seats. But we've got 7% lower cost per seat in terms of the cash operating cost. We've got 400 miles more range. We've got the 18-inch seat compared to their 17 0.2 inch seat now because they're trying to carve out the interior a little bit. So we think this airplane not only does a fantastic job of replacing 777 300ERs, but when you do need to have a competition running it nose to nose with a 777X, it's a pretty good alternative. Those 32 to 40 incremental seats have got to be worth an awful lot to you to carry all this inefficiency for those 32 to 40 seats. Remember our catalog price for this airplane, and net price is going to be lower than a 777X, significantly lower. So we are on the fence about whether we really need to produce an airplane to go after the 777X nose to nose in that same size category. And we're going back and forth talking to airlines about that. What we are doing is improving the, uh, the 350, and this is the 350-900ULR, which will be replacing 34500s, which were doing the longest non-stop flights to Singapore Airlines just a few years ago, it's going Singapore to New York, Singapore to Los Angeles. So, this is what uh, you know, Chun Pong uh, Go is saying. He really likes that airplane. Uh, compared to the 777-8, which is a smaller version of the 777-X, we've got 40 tons less empty weight in this one, and a 10% cost per seat saving for an airplane that can do the same mission. He looked at both. Remember, when he decided to do this, the 777-8 was available, and he said, no, 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 I want to go with the efficient airplane, uh, getting us to, uh, uh, to New York City from Singapore. And we're not stopping here. It's continuous improvement going forward. Here we'll talk a little bit more about this, but between now and 2020, we'll be improving fuel burn by another 2%. We'll be improving range by another 500 nautical miles, and we'll be getting another five tons in payload, that's cargo or passengers, whatever you want, in the A350. Worth $4 million in net present value over the life of the airplane. And the way this normally gets calculated, uh, it's worth $4 million. Uh, we believe that the airline gets half of that, and we get the other half of that. So we charge another couple million dollars uh, for those packages going forward. And then last but not least, we have the A380, a uh, fantastic airplane. A lot of you wouldn't believe it, but every three minutes, every three minutes, an A380 takes off or lands somewhere in the world on a revenue passenger flight. I've got a big uh, plasma screen uh, in my office in real time watching every 380 fly around the world. It's mesmerizing. Sometimes I can sit there and stare at it for an hour and get absolutely nothing done. But then you will watch the airplanes, you have to touch them, it tells you all about this is Singapore flight, this is his speed, this is his altitude, here's where he's going, here's where he departed. It's, it's uh, very, very fascinating going forward. Anyway, we know the future has to be in this size category. We're doubling every 15 years around the world. We're doubling traffic every 10 years in Asia Pacific. Are we doubling the number of airports? Well, maybe in China, I'll give you that. They are, but no place else in the world. Look at Heathrow, look at Charles de Gaulle, look at Frankfurt, JFK, LAX. We're not doubling airport capacity. In fact, it's virtually impossible to do much more than tweak the airport capacity and the edges. We have to have bigger aircraft going forward. There'll be 75 megacities in in uh, 10 years, not 20 years, in 10 years from now, 75 megacities. Everyone says, we'll all be flying point to point. I agree. 
connecting those is point-to-point -point flying, and it has to be done with A380s. Nobody wants to go to the airport to have your 3.10 a.m. departure or arrive at some airport at 4.10 in the morning. Even the leisure passengers don't want to do that. So flying bunches up around day flights and night flights, and the, it'll continue doing that in the future. Here are three mega airports, Los Angeles, London Heathrow, in Hong Kong. Today, at Hong Kong, there are 14 daily A380 flights, and that's where they're going. 14 a day going out of Hong Kong. If we go to Los Angeles, 24 flights a day. People say, well, when are the Americans going to get a chance to fly on the 380? An awful lot of Americans are flying on A380s today. Unfortunately, not with the US carriers, but they are flying on A380s. 24 flights a day goes into Los Angeles. And this one absolutely amazes me. Into Heathrow, there are 50 A380 flights a day. 50. 8% of all passengers in 2015 flew on an A380. This year, it'll be 10%. Uh, this comes from the British uh, Airport Authority. They gave us these numbers. You go through Heathrow and you see these massive hordes of people everywhere, pushing and shoving, long queues for immigration and, and uh, security. Just think about that next time you're there. 10% of everyone you see out there is getting on or getting off an A380. 10% of all the people going through 80 today, going to Heathrow today, are doing it with an A380. Well, Heathrow is one of the great airports of the world, but we're also full. And uh, when you're at capacity, you need to have the largest planes operating from your airport to be able to serve more passengers. And that is what the A380 does. It's one of the largest, it is the largest plane in the world. It helps us to serve more passengers on the very busy routes uh, out of Heathrow. And it also frees up slots to allow us to serve some new routes in North America, South America, and Asia that we wouldn't otherwise be able to serve. We know that every single year when you have a daily non-stop overseas flight coming into Los Angeles, it generates hundreds of millions of dollars in economic growth and economic activities. With A380, uh, the capacity increases, so we have even more people coming. So I'm sure that number is even higher than it before. The image of a community is in part determined by its airport and the airlines that serve that airport. And we're very proud of the fact that so many of our airlines use A380s because it provides exactly the kind of quality service that I know their passengers want and that our customers here and residents here want to fly on when they take a long flight to overseas. A whole host of aircraft choices will encourage a lot of passengers to uh, choose our airport. And of course, the fact that uh, the availability of uh, AE's deities and other um, wide body aircrafts is actually a very positive way of encouraging more passengers to choose the Hong Kong International Airport in the future. For over the last 30 years, the number of people impacted by aircraft noise at Heathrow has pretty much halved. That's because of new technologies such as the A380. And it means that we can expand Heathrow um, still and have fewer people impacted by aircraft noise because of aircraft like the A380. That is why we incentivize airlines to bring their cleanest, quietest planes such as the A380 here to Heathrow. You know, when an A380 takes off from London Heathrow, it's behind a 747-400. It probably has about 100 to 150 more people on board. It has half the noise footprint on the community as that 747 in front of it. That's why they're so impressed. Airports around the world are banking on the A380 to allow them to fly more people through their hubs and do it more economically with less environmental impact, less noise footprint. Only the A380 can do that going forward. And what about the passengers? Here's a survey, uh, independent survey that was done in terms of how does it stack up against the 777, which is another workhorse out there in the marketplace. And you can see in first class, much better, business class, much better. But look at that, premium economy and even economy class. Why economy class? They don't have showers. What's the difference in an economy class seat? Well, if you go in an Emirates economy class seat at 10 abreast on a 380, you get about a 19 and a half inch seat. Not 18, 19 and a half inch seat 
If you go on their 777, you get a 17 inch seat. Both are 10 abreast. The 777 and the A380 in economy are both 10 abreast at Emirates and a lot of other airlines around the world. So the economy class passenger sees a dramatic uh, improvement in the quality of his flight. People go out of their way to fly on A380s when they go forward. Well, that's our product line. We sell product to the airlines and they, uh, we sell comfort to the airlines and they sell it to their customers as well. People know the difference. People go online to see in uh, not just Flight Tracker and the rest, Seat Guru, to find out what they're getting involved in when they get involved in a fare. We have the standard of 18 inches across our product line. We have the standard in terms of efficiency. Airlines need efficiency. They need lower fuel burn. And that means lower impact on the environment. And all that brought together means profitability. We can show that we can offer the airline passenger improved comfort and a better flying experience, and the airline more profit. And that's why we have over 50% of the market. Well, thank you very much.